G'day you cracking humans. So today is an interview with uh, Jesse Carlson who is, is someone who I put up very high uh, on my admire scale uh, in terms of the cycling world. So Jesse was the winner of the Trans America Road Race, the 2015 version. So basically, let me take it a step back. The Trans America Bike Race is a self-supported annual event. Uh, it's an ultra-distance cycling event, completely unsupported. It's roughly 4,200 miles or 6,800 kilometers. Uh, it's only been run for two years. So it was the 2014 and 2015 editions. And Jesse won the 2015 edition. So. Uh, I think it was a guy called Mike Hall that won the 2014 version. It starts in Oregon and finishes in Virginia. And uh, the clock never stops. It's, a, it's an individual time trial. You're completely unsupported. And what that means is you have to dose your effort. You, you have to measure, you know, you have to work out your sleep and your food and everything. And you can't get any help whatsoever for the duration of the ride. Now, Jesse finished this event in 18 days. Now, I want you to stop and think about the, the magnitude of this achievement, okay? Jesse suffered gastroenteritis. He was spewing. He had to admit himself into a doctor's, I think he went to hospital or a doctor's surgery. I think he actually might have, he says it in the interview, he stayed overnight somewhere. I mean, I can't fathom this achievement, right? 18 days of nonstop riding with very, very few hours sleep. He was doing like four 400 kilometers a day. Now you think about doing that for maybe three days and think about your mental state and how you'd feel. Jesse did this for 18 days. Like that is over two weeks. He was just, not many people could do that. Not many people could push through that level of achievement. So here's the interview with Jesse. I want you to get an understanding that I put this guy right up there in terms of crazy, like uh, unbelievable ability to, to push through barriers of human achievement. Really interesting guy. Check out the interview. Chat with you soon. Hey everyone. Uh, just cruise along through Big Sky, Montana. Favorite part of the Tour Divide. I may have a look. It's pretty spectacular. I rode across part of the way to Adelaide with you, and I remember sitting on the bike, looking at you several times when I was in the hurt house, and you were laughing and giggling and and just this positive attitude, and I kept thinking to myself, this guy is a freak. This guy is a freak. Which brings me to my next point, and that is the Trans-America race in 2015 that you won. And it, it got me thinking how there's not many people in the world that could not only win it, but ride and push themselves to that limit. So, and then I looked up the race across America and I was trying to compare the two. So can you tell us the difference, the difference between the two yeah, sure. races? And, I, and I, my understanding is that the Trans America makes the race across America look silly. Oh, I don't know. It's, they're sort of different. It's, it's sort of, uh, it's a, they're two different sports really, in yeah. a way, or, or two different, yeah, two very different events. So the race across America is a supported event. So um, you ride with the support of a, a team that follows you along in, a, in an RV usually. Um, and I think uh, it's usually quite a big team. So there'll be a doctor and there'll be you know, all the support crew. You just don't have to stop riding. You just cruise along and people will hand you bottles. And um, yeah, the winners typically sleep some incredibly small amount of time over the course of eight days. Um, and so those guys, I, I've got some, you know, I could, I've got, I've had serious man crushes on some of those guys um, over the years. Yuri Robic um, is one of the famous guys, Slovenian army guy who was, there's a great article in the New York Times about this guy which talks about the human uh, limit of human performance and you know where things break down. And so just to show that um, for this guy, the, the case was it, it's not a physical breakdown, it's a mental breakdown that happens before the physical breakdown. 
So famously, his support crew were all, you know, Slovenian military in fatigues, all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, they'd say when Yuri thinks he's going to die on the bike, um, and he is serious about it, he's we figure he has 50% left. <laughs> so I mean, those guys. I'm just these stories just to give you a picture for the the, the guys who do this sort of stuff. Sadly, Yuri Robic, he's passed away. He, he, he was hit by a, a car in a training accident um, near his his home in Slovenia. I think it was in 2010. He might have passed away. He was actually training for a race in Australia, the Crop Trophy, mountain bike race, stage race. Um, anyway, so I digress. So Ram supported, um, you You just, you don't have to stop. Everything's taken care of for, uh, for you. Your support team will give you bottles, you flat, you know, you get a new wheel, all that sort of thing. Um, Transamerica race is very different. So Transamerica is, a, is an unsupported event. Um, so you're, you're out there by yourself, um, you can only you have to carry all the gear you need to survive, um, and so obviously that's a pretty critical choice with all the climbing you have to do through through uh, along the course. Um, you need to decide well what you need to take with you because you've got to lug all that stuff over all the hills. So um, you know, so you're carrying everything you need to survive on your bike. You have to find food and water where you can. Um, decide where you're going to sleep. Um, so sure, you can sleep in hotels if you can find them, but you know, if you're out in the wilderness um, and you, you, you're wrecked and you've got nowhere to go and there's a bloody snowstorm coming in, well, you're there by yourself. You need to have the stuff uh, with you to survive. So um, so it's, a, it's one stage. The clock doesn't stop, similar to RAM. The clock doesn't stop. Yeah. Um, so you decide how much you ride, how much you sleep. Yeah. And uh, and that's that's pretty much it. It's pretty simple. It's like a stage race, but with one stage. Yeah, the thing that blew me away when I first got into this stuff was in the Tour Divide, yeah. which is an off-road equivalent. So you ride from Banff in Canada yeah. to the Mexican border, just crisscrossing the the Rockies. Yeah, off-road. Anyway, so that was kind of my first big event. Yeah, that's right. Because right, I read up about this. So yeah, yeah, it's my first first big event. And yeah. so anyway, two two. Uh, two guys who are far better at this stuff than I am. This guy, Mike Hall, who had the, you know, he's, he's raced around the world. He had like the unsupported, um, you know, he's got the fastest unsupported time around the world. Um, and he'd raced the Tour Divide before. Um, and there's this other guy, Craig Stapler from Canada, who raced the Tour Divide at least once before, maybe a couple of times, I think. Mm. Um, had some terrible luck. The, the prior year when a pedal broke on him. Yeah. Middle of nowhere, not far from the end when him and uh, another guy, Ollie, Ollie from New Zealand were, were duking it out for the win. Um, so he was back. So Mike was at this thing and Stappy was there and they were fit and strong and experienced. And uh, yeah, I was there as well with no, no experience in any of this sort of stuff at all. So turned up at the start line and you just see the bikes that they're riding and how little they're carrying. And you go, oh, and you just, you've lost already mentally. You're just like, wow, I'm sitting there. I'm looking at some Ferraris there. You can just see how light that you're moving the bike around, how light it is. And you just, it's like you've lost before you've even started. Um, but that comes with um, experience too. So, you know, they'll know how little food and water they can, they can carry. They'll know, they might even know, well, because they've done the event before, they'd know where the resupply points were. So anyway, I'm there with five liters of water, right? So if, if a guy's got two liters, well, there's three kilos more that you're carrying, right? Um, and then you sort of extrapolate that across the rest of the kit and you think, geez, I'm carrying way too much stuff here. Um, and you think, well, how do these races start? Um, and I, I didn't know, I thought, well, we'll just cruise out and see what happens. So, but they start like any other race, cruise out and you start to, you start to hit the first little hills, suddenly, pace picks up a bit and you're down to 10 and there's like 140 at the start maybe more and you, suddenly you're down to 10 looking around and everyone's still comfortable a few stragglers at the back you hit the next hills and then you're down to five the next ones and then we're eventually we're down to three and yeah we have a, have a little chat and sure enough it's Mike Michael and and Craig Stapler Stappy and I was there too and I was thinking oh yeah right here we go well, down to three, that's, that's how it starts. The other guys had dropped off. Um, and that's when they started riding. Um, and so these guys were, they were 
they were working hard. So, um, oh no, maybe they weren't. Um, but it looked like it to me. I could hear them. I could hear them breathing up the hills. You know when people are, you know, working hard. Um, so and the pace we were holding was was tough. Like it was a strong pace. So I was in good shape at the time, and and the pace they were holding was incredible. It was just, it was it was mental. And I was I was just thinking. I could see them working hard, like out of the saddle on the climbs, just just grinding. And I thought. I could do this for 24 hours. I know because I'd done 24 hour racing. I, I know I can do that. But but two weeks, this is insane. How can the, how could you possibly do this? So I had to go, I had to let them go. I had to go, well, if you can hold that pace, hats off to you guys. You guys are amazing. You've, you've got this. So anyway, let them go, settled into a better pace for myself. Um, turns out, so the first stop for the for um, the first safe point to stop up in the mountains in Canada, this is bear country, grizzly country, is this little cabin up in the hills called Butts Cabin after about 320 k's. Um, and so they'd covered that, I think, in under 15 hours. Like this is, and with probably 6,000 metres of climbing, um, just big day, and carrying all your stuff, mind you, to survive in the wilderness. Um, so we rocked up to to Butts Cabin probably an hour and a half after they did. Um, and so that was cue for them to get up and hit the road. So they had probably, well, maybe they had an hour and a half off. Who knows if they slept at all. But they heard us get there and then that, they're out of there. So um, the cabin was locked so we couldn't get in. Um, and so they wait till we, we're um, all asleep on the ground in bear country outside in the cold. They've had to sleep in the cabin and they're off, off hitting it again. So. Um, so they've had like a, maybe an hour's rest, but one of them's up, so the other's got to go. So then they hit it again for the next day. And so, and at the same point, so they, they just went like this until one of them, one of them broke. So Mike went on the attack, um, I think through the basin. I think he pretty much rode straight through. He might've ridden for 30 something hours um, in order to crack Stappy. Um, and he got the gap and, um, and it was just, it's just hard to communicate that. So like to go that hard all day and then to have maybe an hour, hour and a half sleep and then to get up and hit it again all day. You've got that guy there. Every climb, they're just, they're just attacking. Um, and then it's just that hard, aggressive racing, but, but not just for six hours, but, but until one of them is done. Um, and so, and I think it's that, that just blew my mind. I just, you, you come at it, you see that and you just have, you could, you imagine that just belting up these climbs with all this shit strapped to your bike and they're just you know going lactic out of the saddle working hard and they just keep going like you have an hour's sleep and then you keep going into the next day and maybe the same again the next night and you just keep going until you've broken the other guy and then you've got the gap and off you go so and then you have to settle in and then you still have to ride another 3,000 kilometers to get to the end uh, through the mountains so I don't know, that element of the race is just um, that hard, aggressive racing over day after day after day is, yeah. um, it's just super tough yeah. and it's hard to, you know, just, just maintaining that, that and, effort. And um, that is where it's so unique. Yeah. It's very few, I mean, forget about the wattages, forget mm. about the, the detail. Yeah. That is the that is the essence of what yeah. we're talking about. And it's hard to, it's hard to um, see those efforts without having just incredible respect for those guys like just to see what they're able to do like it's it's fine i mean i've i've been able to to do some of these events but it and it, it doesn't matter i think um any any of any of the riders in this field will look at what these other guys are doing like look at those race efforts and go you just can't come out of it without having just tremendous respect for, for these guys and what they've what they've done, and so. you are one of these guys. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. as it turns out, that's that's really why we're sitting mm. here. Yeah, but but anyway, it's uh, it's hard. It's hard to communicate how how tough it is, and I'm not trying to do that to I don't know blow my own trumpet or anything like that, but just to try to convey that feeling of yeah. of maintaining that race effort where you're just trying to. You're just trying to stay ahead, or you're just keeping. You just got to keep pushing it, like grinding up a hill, trying to, trying to consolidate that lead, try to get that gap. You know, get up that hill, make them. You know, knowing that you've got to 
you've got to make them suffer more to get to that point and just keeping that race mentality yeah. going is just but, yeah, it's but, mind but to sustain it yeah. for so many days yeah. and yeah. I'm not just talking hours days yeah. upon days that is the part that yeah. wigs me out I think it, that might be why it takes so long to recover from them because it's not it's not so much the physical recovery it's that mental recovery it's sort yeah. of like you've trapped yourself in this little box yeah. and you're not allowed out until yeah. you get to the end and yeah. so it's sort of like you're your oppressor is yourself yeah. right so you finish the event and that doesn't switch off instantly so yeah. trying to get sleep after these events for me it's quite hard because yeah. sleep's been a bad thing for so long suddenly it's good well that doesn't switch off so yeah. i'll just finish these races wake up bolt up right after three hours let's go um but the race is done yeah so and then you're sitting there not able to sleep um so yeah, you it, would condition yourself. Yeah, it's quite yeah. weird. I mean, I have that trouble. Others, others might not. Mm. Um, but it's it's something I've I've struggled with after these these races. It or that that sort of um, that mentality of sleep being bad and you know just being yeah. being on edge in that sort of race mentality. That doesn't just instantly switch off. Well, maybe I'm not good at it, but it yeah. just yeah it, it sticks around. So Incredible. that's why I think you need to just. Well, for me anyway, you need to let yourself off the hook afterwards you yeah. know, for an extended period yeah. um, and just treat yourself like a friend rather than an yeah. en enemy again. So, yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, but anyway, it's, um, that, that sort of element is, I don't know, maybe I'm not communicating it well, but it's, um, I can see it clear in my head, but it, it's not about the, the huge distances or the, the long hours or the fatigue. It's just, yeah, how do you... How do you put up with that mentally, that race element, you know, for so long? So, um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. But yeah, so hats off to all the guys at the top doing that, that sort of thing. It's just, yeah, it's mind-blowing stuff. Um, it's sort of like uh, when you talk to those guys, and I've been lucky enough to speak to a few of them over Skype, it's sort of like one part support group because it's like, okay, this is someone he understands, you know, like, you don't feel like people understand what it's what it's really like. So you talk to these guys, and yeah, there's there's only a few of them around the world probably who, who kind of get it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of cool to talk to them. It's sort of like one part, um, you know, massive respect for those guys, but one part support group. <laughs> yeah, the guys who are pushing it in any any aspect, you know, who are right at the edge of that, um, you know, what's what's humanly possible. Mm -hmm. um, I find that stuff really fascinating. So, and the guys who are out there trying to pioneer it, push it further, um, it's just, yeah, you, you can't help but have massive respect for those guys. Um, yeah, just purely from tasting it a little bit myself, um, you just, you see what those those guys do, those those guys who are really out there pushing it. And um, yeah, you can't help but, but really admire what they do. I, I, Even I if love, it is a little crazy. I love how you say those guys when you're actually one of those guys. <laughs> So how, like, so you and I, going back to Adelaide, you rode 450, 450 kilometres yep. the day before. You caught up with me and I rode roughly 200 kilometres with you. And I remember thinking, this guy has done 450 k's the day before. And then I started referencing this Trans America race and how I feel so shit now. Imagine how you felt after seven days, nine days, 12 days. Yeah. How long were you sleeping? Um, I think I was doing about four hours, maybe a little bit longer a night. I wasn't really, to be honest, I mean, that sounds like a short amount of time, but I, you can push it a lot harder than that. So you can, you can really crunch your sleep down if you need to. Um, so I was probably doing about four hours a night along the way. So trying to ride or take care of myself or find food or whatever for about 20 hours a day. So I was trying to do about 400 Ks a day, um, over 20 hours and, but when you start doing this stuff, you find that just finding food and um, you know finding water and taking care of yourself, all that sort of thing, um, takes a lot of time. Um, and so, to to cover 400 k's over that um, over that 20 hour period is um, yeah, it's quite a challenge. So maintaining a, a sort of 20 k an hour average, including all your stops and that sort of thing, um, through all sorts of weather and terrain and all that sort of thing, it, it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an ask. So yeah, um, and that's one of the things I find when I talk to people about doing long rides. When you start planning it, they go, oh yeah, we'll we'll average over 30 k's an hour over for the for the day. That'll be fine. Um, and then you think, well, 
you know, if we can hold, if we hold 25 k's an hour, um, including all stops, well, we've done pretty well. Um, so I think that's a bit of a lesson for people. They don't often think about how long that stop time actually is. So yeah, when you're doing these things, you look at your overall average speed. You're not worried about this, the speed when you're, you're riding. You're worried about that overall, right. overall average. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. And was it hard finding food and water and obviously you, you would have, I mean, I've seen your bike, you carried minimal stuff, but was it hard finding good food and? Yeah, it's um, finding, well, finding good food, very hard across, <laughs> um, you know, across some of the more remote parts of the course. Finding food was, wasn't too bad, but you're not, um, you can sort of throw away the, the sports nutrition rule book. Um, you just really have to get what you can find along the way. So, um, and always carry something spare with you too. So, um, and that's kind of a limiting factor in how fast you can go. You, you just, you know what it's like you, on these long rides, you can't physically eat enough food um, to, to support the energy requirement. So you're kind of limited by how fast your body can process the food and turn it into to fuel. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but, but then the thing is, you could be you could be out there and have your hopes set on a meal at a certain town, and you could get there and go, oh, hang on a minute, it's it's Sunday, nothing's open, because um, you don't know what day it is, you don't know whether it's Thursday or Sunday or Monday or whatever. Um, yeah, you get there and there's nothing open, so there's there's not much to do other than hope that you've got some food to get you to the next town. So, or you might get to a place and they say, oh, we've shut the kitchen. Um, but we've got a few chocolate bars and a bag of chips, um, and so you need to rely on that to get you to the next town. Um, so, yeah, one thing that you, you learn on those events is not to have your, your hopes set on getting anything at any particular time, because it can just be crushing. You know, you go, oh, start thinking about this amazing meal you're gonna have at this town, and then you find that, you know, that place is no longer open, it's shut down. Um, so, it's, it can be crushing, especially when you're fatigued and you're tired, and you know, you need that fuel to get over the next mountain pass. Um, so it, from a mental point of view, that can just be, you know, that can be catastrophic. You just end up having a breakdown oh, after that. Absolutely. So, and so how yeah. do you mentally keep yourself going, man? I mean, I noticed on our ride across Adelaide, you were so positive and you were, you were just the leader of the group. And I was thinking, cause I mean, I was hurting mm -hmm. and I was thinking to myself, how is this guy just keeping so, mentally strong i don't know i think you with those with any ride i think your your mind just adjusts to the task at hand so if you're doing a, a 50 kilometer ride you know you've got a settling in period at the start and then you're in the middle you you kind of come good for a while and then might get a bit sore towards the end but there's a light at the end of the tunnel to to get you through so but i think that applies as you know that applies for a 50 kilometer ride 100 kilometer ride thousand kilometer ride, eight thousand kilometer ride, it doesn't, doesn't matter, the same rules apply really. And I think, but the longer the ride, the more it calls into question your, what motivation really means. So, it might seem silly, but um, I think you need to, when you do those things, you, you make a contract with yourself beforehand. You go, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna complete this thing. So, and because you know you're gonna get to a point where everything hurts and things might feel like they're breaking or you've got Achilles pain or your back's wrecked and so on. Um, so you need to know when you get to that point, you need to have made that agreement that, you know, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get through this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish this because you've made that contract with yourself that you are gonna finish it. So it, it seems, seems a bit silly because um, it doesn't mean so much on a, like a 200 kilometer ride or something shorter, but when, when it is such a long ride, um, you can very easily get to a point and go, you know what, this is just stupid. You know, I don't, I've done enough, haven't I? I've, I've ridden 5,000 Ks, that's, that's great, isn't it? Um, maybe we'll just pull the pin now, that's, that's good enough, I'm happy with that. Um, so you need to rewind and think, no, no, I've made this agreement with myself that I'm gonna get through this and I'm gonna finish the job. Um, and so it depends on how seriously you take that. So you need to make it up front before you, you get into the mental turmoil and all the sleep deprivation and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it really draws, calls into question what motivation means for someone. Like, what are you gonna draw upon to keep going when everything's just falling apart? When your plan's gone out the window, your back's destroyed, you're going a lot slower than you thought, 
there's 10 people up the road um, that you thought you might be ahead of. So what are you gonna draw upon to get yourself through to the end or are you gonna quit? So I think the people who finish are the ones who just, who want to. Yeah. It seems silly, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think it, that question of what motivation means just becomes more and more important for the, the longer, longer the event is. You can, you can ride all day um, and all night and there's a guy just right there um, and then how much you, you stop to go to sleep, but that's part of the race as well. How long do you sleep? And, and I suppose what you're saying to me is, how does a race like this come about, or how do you strategically go, uh, how do you plan for yeah, it? Yeah, well, that's the thing, like the race, the race aspect of it is, it's just, the reason these things are appealing is because I think they're, they're kind of the, the toughest races there are, um, because the riding's only a small part of it, to be honest, it's like, Maintaining that psychological trauma of having someone chasing you down or trying to chase someone, like that's fine for a few hours, six hours, eight hours, 12, 24, but like two weeks, it just, it gets, the, the guys who are at the top of the game in this is, they're just amazing. To maintain that, that, um, that psychological trauma of being hunted down for that long, it's, um, I mean, that's, you have nightmares about that stuff, right? You have nightmares about getting chased. And it's like, well, when you're sleeping, that's part of the race too. So you yeah. go down to bed, down to sleep. Well, it's like, am I gonna sleep? How much sleep do I need? Well, geez, I'd love, I'd love six hours, but... Um, Cheers, buddy. I'd love six hours of sleep, but it's like, you've gotta be, you've gotta be tough and go, no, all right, I want six, I'm gonna give myself three. Um, but if the guy gets up after one and a half, you're going to have to go up and go out and, and chase him down. You got to, the race is still on. So So do you sleep together? Or yeah, does he we, sleep further down the road? Yeah, so there's tactics in these races. Um, you know, a lot of the, some of these races are off-road as well. So you're sleeping out in the middle of nowhere in bear country. So uh, sometimes on, on narrow trails as well. Um, this isn't the Transamerica race that I was on, but some of the other ones. Um, but some of the tactics people have are, you know, they'll sleep, they'll be the only water source in a whole area um, for hundreds of k's maybe, and um, they'll sleep under that water source. So someone has to wake them up in order to use the water. <laughs> so then they get woken up and off they go. So um, it's sort of like when you attack in races like this, well, you might have to attack and, and just ride straight through for 24 hours just to get, to get a gap. So, yeah. That is absolutely yeah. incredible. So someone yeah. will sleep under the water source. Yeah, they'll, they'll, or if it's uh, in the mountain bike events, they'll sleep across a, a particularly narrow bit of single track. So the next rider coming through, if they're coming up, they'll bump into them. And so, so that, well, they'll have to climb over them or get around them some way. So that's, that's, how, they, um, that's how they race. So like there's, there's, um, there's, the maintaining that for such a long time it's um the, the guy who i i've got um he's probably the best in the game a guy mike hall he he explained it as being like a like a fugitive um being like a fugitive you're always you know you're always on the run um you know you go into a supermarket you're being hunted down even then to try to get your food you're in a restaurant eating it's like well do i stay there for too long because I'm being chased, I've got to get out of here. So, it's so true. So um, maintaining that stress, you can think about that stress, you know, in the race where you've got, you, you're sort of on your limit and you've got that guy behind you and they're chasing you down. It's, it's tough mentally, you've got to tough it out and get through it. Extend that over two weeks um, and try to maintain that, that, that sort of mental state of that aggressive, tough racing where at no point are you being friendly to yourself. It's like, well, I need six hours of sleep, all right? I'm gonna give myself three. Or, you know, it's that sort of thing. Uh, it's all, always, um, yeah, it's such, it's such a, I don't know, it's, I haven't seen it covered well, like that, that sort of, how difficult that aspect is. Yeah. You sort of see people talk about the numbers, and the numbers are stupid, right? You're doing hundreds of Ks a day, and you're not sleeping much, and all that sort of thing, but just really trying to understand, you know, you've, you've ridden all day, and then you sleep for a couple of hours, and you, you sort of, that's part of the race. It's like, you know, how, how little am I going to sleep? And then yeah. going into diners and getting food, well, you've got to get in and out. Um, yeah. yeah. All at the same time, all, at, all along, yeah. And, and during all of that, you've got to um, make sure you don't lose your credit card or you don't leave your multi-tool somewhere or you've zipped everything up so your tubes don't drop out. And so anyway, you've got to, you've got to hold it together as well at the same time. So. 
So going back to what you were saying about the mental fortitude it takes to get through something like this, which I, I can't fathom personally, but you got sick at one stage, you got gastro or food poisoning, and you know, I would imagine that at a time like that, it's easy to give up. Yeah. It's easy to quit it or, or take a couple of days off and come in 10th and just say you're finished. You won the event, you pushed through it. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that was, that was very rough. So I think, there was, I think it was about a three day patch where I had some either gastro or food poisoning, something, you know, GI distress, you know, it wasn't, wasn't fun. So um, I was struggling to, um, struggling to keep food and fluids in my body. Um, While yeah. doing 400 k's of wave, mind you. Yeah, still trying to, still trying to push the pace a bit. Um, but again, it get, gets back to making that agreement with yourself up front. It's like, no, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get through this. And as well, part of it was doing this ride. We were um, with Curve Cycling as well. We had this, um, this new bike, the Belgi, which was our road bike. And I really owed it to the guys to, to give it a good test ride. And this was, this was the test ride, kind of stupid, really. Um, so I had to, I couldn't let him down as well. So I had that in my mind too. Um, so I kept pushing through and then it just got ridiculous at one point. I was bombing down into the, the valley near Breckenridge in Colorado. Um, and I remember pulling into, I was looking for, for toilet after toilet. So I found a little toilet in a, in a rest area. And um, surely you were just going in the bush as well. Well, yeah, but it's it can get um, it can yeah it, it's a bit messy <laughs> as well. So but look, the luxury of a toilet was great. So yeah, I was um, yeah it's definitely doing doing the business in the in the woods. But um, if you've got a, a bathroom to go to, it's a bit of a luxury anyway. Yeah. So I remember going to this this bathroom, and uh, so went in there. And uh, then I heard some rustling outside. I thought, oh shit, um, you know, you're still out in the wilderness. Um, there's all sorts of animals out there in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere in Colorado. And so I thought, uh, well, I had to go out and, and get my bite because if someone was out there eating my food or, or you know, take my credit card or something like that, who knows what could happen, you know, that's the end. Um, so anyway, <laughs> nicks around the ankles, all that sort of thing, run outside to try to get my bike inside. Um, and so it turned out they were just little, oh, I don't know, whatever they were, little squirrel creatures or something running over my bike. So got rid of them. Glad it was that and not a black bear. Um, but anyway, so got the bike inside and then I remember just waking up on the floor of this, this toilet and I didn't know, that I remember bringing the bike inside and then I just remember waking up on the floor in this this bathroom this you know little camp uh like a camp area bathroom in the middle of colorado and i didn't know whether i'd been there for you know four hours three hours two hours or or you know all day but like i just i just i must have been tired fatigued and um just went to sleep on the floor in this this toy. I had no no memory of that that happening. I was just I was just must have been wrecked and run down from not being able to keep the food in and all that sort of thing. And I thought at that point, oh geez, this is getting a bit this is getting a bit silly. Um, need to keep an eye on this. And uh, yeah, so then it wasn't that far to get to Breckenridge through that day. Um, and then things just got progressively worse during the day. So I was stopping more and more to. Um, yeah, just, just it was really getting bad. So I made the call to stop in Breckenridge um, for just to try to try to get better. Um, and so the problem is, I needed to stay indoors that night. I was equipped to, to sleep wherever, but I needed to just be indoors with the bathroom and just to try to you know get everything out. Um, and, but I was rolling into Breckenridge and you know, there's all these, this is resort town, summertime, Colorado. So of course there's bike races on, running races, like everything's on. Um, so I was thinking, oh shit, I'm not gonna be able to get anywhere to stay. So I'm, I'm like riding in, trying to, trying to um, you know, look on the internet to try to find places to stay. Um, you know, I was calling people, uh, calling the, the hotels or backpackers places there, trying to find somewhere. They're all booked out. Um, so the only place I could find was the the like Double Tree Hilton thing. <laughs> so so I logged up to this Double Tree Hilton thing, just looking a total mess. <laughs> and uh, 
and just asked him if they had a broom. <laughs> they saw it looking me up and down. I've just got, I've got nothing, you know, just my bike and there's all these people like wheeling in, you know, having flown into town for the weekend. It's like, um, so yeah, I, I managed to get a room in this double tree Hilton thing in. Well, they would have sympathized with you, surely. They yeah, would well, they, they did. Yeah, yeah, so they, so they did. So anyway, um, I thought, okay, well, I thought that could have been it, right? It could be, could be done. Um, so, but I, I went in and, um, and I think at that, Breckenridge might be at 2,900 meters as well. So you're not, you're not low altitude either. So, um, so yeah, you start noticing those things when you stop. Um, so yeah, pulled into Breckenridge and spent the night on this bike packing race in the, the double tree or whatever in Breckenridge. And I didn't sleep much cause I was, yeah, I was, um, I was using the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how many hours did you stay there? I think I might have been there 14 hours, maybe right. a bit longer. So I guess what I did was I just I didn't set an alarm. I just woke up and I thought um, like I was I was up late, you know, in the bathroom. I thought, oh, well, I'm just I just won't set an alarm. I'll just wake up when I wake up. I'll go down and see if I can eat something, and then we'll just make a call then. So yeah. I, I got up late, I managed to get some breakfast in, and uh, yeah, I, I just kept going. So, um, so did people pass you overnight? Um, not sure, I think I maintained a lead, so um, I, the gap would have come down, I didn't even look, to be honest, I thought, I don't even, I don't even care, like at the moment I just gotta, I just need to take care of myself and, yeah. and um, flush whatever is in me out yeah. um, and so I didn't even look so I don't think they came past because I, I had a pretty big gap still at that point like yeah. I was in these events you're not happy until you've got about a day a day's gap um, because you can imagine being in the middle of nowhere and say you break a pedal I've never broken a pedal before but imagine if you did um, you've got to try to one leg of training yeah, you've got to try to solve that problem you know you ride 300 k to the next bike shop one legged um, so you can imagine all those scenarios where something stupid happens um, and you need to have about a day in order to solve it so so how far were you ahead at this stage uh, sorry how many days into the race were you when you got sick um, I reckon it might have been four or five days so yeah probably day five six and seven okay I think I was I was crook yeah um, and then yeah, a little bit, a little bit after that, where it was flushing out. But um, yeah, I think that it did a lot of damage um, in terms of. I mean, you, you get pretty wiped out if you're not not able to keep the the fuel in. Um, so it was kind of strange. After that, I started to swell up a lot, which was quite weird. So yeah, my face was swollen and my legs were swollen and my arms were a bit swollen. So. It looks it looks a bit weird. You, you know, I mean, you'd think you'd start to get a bit lean by that point in the race, but no, I was I was retaining a lot of fluid for, for whatever reason. I think it's probably related to yeah some damage I did while while being sick and trying to keep pushing. So yeah, don't know. You know, through this, surely it's it's the ultimate test of one's physical ability right? and mental ability, but definitely physical ability also. Did you think, I'm gonna have a heart attack or a stroke? Or did you think at some stage that you could die? Yeah. Uh, like on, on this one, I was I was worried at that, that point, but I, I was looking out. I was trying to look out for myself, you know. I, I stopped and had a break and, and um, you know, then kept going. But, <laughs> but no, I did stop and, and take a look and go, okay, well, you know, is this is this just crazy, or you know, am I going to do some serious damage here? And and who knows? I mean, maybe it was stupid. I'm still, yeah, maybe I'm still recovering. Who knows? But what's the what's the longest you've ridden non-stop? And I know that, and you were telling me that you've ridden from Adelaide to Melbourne and Melbourne Adelaide in one day before. You know, what is the longest that you've ridden non-stop? I don't know, um, and it it kind of depends on what do you mean by non-stop like if i have if you have a, a 30 minute nap does that does that count or? that's that's non-stop as far as i'm concerned so i don't know maybe yeah i don't know maybe towards the end of one of these races or in the middle somewhere i might have might have ridden i don't know i don't know i think at the end of this race i might have ridden something like well close over 800 k's non, non-stop maybe a bit longer and this is at, this is at the end 
of near well, over two weeks, oh, well over two weeks. Yeah, of yeah. racing. Well, you just want to finish it. You just want to get it done. So yeah, I just remember that. Um, yeah, to finish it, I would. I think I probably. So I might have woken up. Oh, I'm just guessing here, but I might have woken up at say three or something in the morning, um, and got on the road, then rode all that day, all that night, and then just and finished the the next the next morning sort of thing. Um, you know, stopping for food and that. I might have had a like a 10 minute nap somewhere along the way, but that was the to the finish. So um, you just want to get it done, really. You get to a point where it's like, all right, well, I don't want to be out here any longer. It's time to time to finish it. Yeah. At, at what point did you know you'd won the race? Really weird that 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 sort of you know uh, I've got I've got this now. It wasn't um, it really wasn't until really close to the end because it was kind of weird out there. I was thinking there are all sorts. I had, I had um, some other run-ins with bad weather and all that sort of thing, and that that held me up. Um, and I was you're always kind of thinking. Geez, what's gonna what's gonna get me next? You know, what what's the next problem I'm gonna have to deal with? Yeah. Um, so it's not so much riding in these events; it's more dealing with the all the the issues that you face. You know, yeah. whether it's sickness or or terrible weather or running out of food. Yeah. Um, so you're kind of thinking, shit, anything could happen at any time. So it wasn't until I was getting pretty close to the end, actually, that I was thinking. I just remember having a thought, like I was happy with the gap that I had. Like got back up to a day, and I thought I'd just maintain that. But I thought it wasn't until the last 30 odd kilometres where I went, you know what, I could just, I could walk. I could walk from here and, and I've, I've got this now. So it wasn't until that, that really late stage in the event that I thought, oh yeah, I think I've, I think I've, um, I've got this in the bag now. It wasn't, yeah. yeah, it wasn't, wasn't until very late on. So I thought, well, you know, if I break a pedal or my, like your bike snaps or a bend a wheel, like just taco a wheel, I can still just walk. I can yeah. walk from here and yeah. I'll be fine. So, <laughs> Unreal. Was there a lot of fanfare when you arrived? Like was it this huge people everywhere sort of screaming your home or was it you rocked up and there was three people there and you uh, gave a couple of high fives out? <laughs> well, when I rocked up there was, there was no one there, no one at all. Um, and it's kind of cool in a way um, to, to finish it like that because there's, it's, yeah, it's weird. The only motivation that's going to get you through something like that is that internal motivation, I think. Um, it's not, I think in these really long events, it might not, I don't think money or anything like that, it's probably enough of motivation to, to keep you going. Something needs to happen within to keep, keep driving yourself to the, to the finish. So. It's kind of fitting, in a way, to finish by yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, you finish, roll in, job's done. Yeah, you can right. reflect on what you've you've been able to achieve, and um, and then then get back into the real world. So, yeah. I'd organised. So my um, my my partner Bron, she was she was actually in the states for work at the time. So she'd organised to come down and meet me at the finish. <clears throat> so. She was. She wanted to be there at the finish, um, and so she was. She was watching the spot tracker during the night, uh, GPS signal that beams up to show where you are, and um, she was checking that. And it turns out I had an issue with the spot tracker about 30 k's from the finish. Um, so she saw that I'd stop. Well, my spot tracker stopped there, and um, she just thought, oh, something's happened. He stopped there. He'll. He may. Maybe he's having a sleep. He'll finish later. Um, but if Anyone who knows about the, you know, the detail of the writing and that, there's no way in hell you'd stop with 30 k's to go. You just, you just get it done. So anyway, I finished and um, then gave her a call, um, and she was mortified because she wanted to be there at the end. Of course, yeah. So, um, and she, she, she won't believe me. She still wouldn't believe me. But it actually worked out really well. It was good to get there, finish it, um, yeah, with no one around, nothing. You know, yeah. early morning on the coast. This big monument to you know, uh, um, to historic in, in U.S. In, in U.S. history and and uh, just to reflect on on what what had just happened. It just yeah. felt like a long a long day was coming to an end. Yeah. Um, so it was good just to sit there and think about it for a bit, and then and Take then Bron in. showed up. Bron came tearing through the car park, carrying a few beers, going, oh, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry." <laughs> so, 
Oh, it's okay. So that's I awesome. First, I had my first crash as well when really? I was there at the finish. So I was lying on the monument. It turned out the monument had a slight slope on it. Um, so it wasn't just like a flat bed, it was just a little slope. Um, anyway, my bike started to wobble a bit as Brom was coming over and I went to try to grab it because I didn't want it to break. I rolled off the, the monument and, and chopped up my knee a bit on the, on the gravel. So that was my first crash of the whole, whole bloody thing. <laughs> well, that's a good result actually, isn't it? Really? It's not no, a bad result. Funny. But yeah, so there's no fanfare at the end. Um, Unreal. For the next guys who came through, after me, I... Um, I went down to the finish, had some beers um, with me. How long um, later? How far? Uh, the next day. So I, yeah. I finished early in the morning and then, so yeah, it was the, the day after and sort of that afternoon sort of thing. Went down and had a, took down a few beers and it was good to see the, the guys come in afterwards yeah. and have a chat with them. Absolutely. About what had gone on. So yeah. Cause Bonding. It, yeah, it's pretty. Cute. These events, you see people at the start, like you'll be having a chat at the start and then go, okay, right, it's time to, time see in, to start, see in three start weeks. And then you don't see, you don't see anyone. So I was pretty much by myself the whole, whole time after, you know, after the first couple of hours. And so I didn't see anyone. So it's just, you're just by yourself. So it was kind of cool to, to see them at the end and um, have a chat and say well done and have a, have a beer. Um, but yeah, so it, they're, they're not, terribly social events if you're at the front of the field uh, but it sounds like the guys further back in the field were having a great time you know while they're they're racing but you find people will be a similar speed so they might finish up at the same spot each night or, or use use that as motivation they'll see that you know this guy's gotten to that town so they'll try to get there as well and then they'll wake up at the same time and start riding together so um so I think they, while racing, they still develop, you know, it looks like they develop great, great bonds and great, great friendships come out of it as well. Yeah. It can be really, by the sounds of it, it can be what, what you want it to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think people kind of do all sorts of things. Some people go, oh, you know, I'm not in it for the race. I'm just here to have a bit of fun and, you know, still go reasonably quick, but I'm not in it for the race. And then I don't know whether they're just saying that or whether whether things change along the way where suddenly they go, oh no, 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 now I'm racing. <laughs> so, and I think other people go the other way. They might they might start out um, racing, but something happens, something flares up and or they, it just might not be for them and they slow down and decide to tour, so. It's it's a bit of sandbagging. I think sandbagging in is natural across any medium or, you know, across any uh, endeavor. Yeah, no, but, I, think, um, I think you're right, yeah. I think there's an element of that going on as well, yeah. yeah. But uh, so what's what's next? I know you're doing a epic, similar adventure to Ayers Rock this yeah. year. Yeah, so we're doing. I, I thought I'd um, try to put on my own event because it's it's um, it's funny when you when you finish these events. Um, I don't know. It's for me anyway. It's rare in life to to sort of feel that sense of satisfaction with something you've done. You know, often nothing's quite good enough or whatever. But these these things, these missions, are so big that they're so big that um, you can't help but feel proud of what you've done, satisfied, and you think, um, "Geez, I want everyone to experience that." that would, I mean, it would be. I want everyone to have that feeling. Um, and so I thought. It'd be good to do something in Australia, something that showcased a bit of the real Australia as well. Um, so we're doing this race to the rock. So we'll go from Adelaide to, to Uluru um, in September this year. So it's about, it's predominantly off-road though, this one. So it's gonna be pretty remote. Um, we're talking, you know, desert, desert roads and that sort of thing, some big gaps between services. Um, but that just brings a different element to it. So it's not technical mountain biking, but you know, you could have a section, who knows what the roads are going to be like. So at the back of Fink, you could have some sections that are pretty sandy. Um, could, could be pretty rocky, who knows? Um, yeah, but there'll be some big gaps between services. And um, I thought, you know, you could typically these races will go through mountainous areas and all that sort of thing. But Australia's unique in that we've got this great, you know, inland, the big, you know, the the outback and the red center um, and I thought that'd be it'd be great to just just dive straight into that yeah um, yeah and I thought it might be of interest to, to people around the world too so yeah. we've got we've got some interest from 
from some guys in Europe and the state. So hopefully that turns into a few guys from offshore coming in and, and having having a race. So have you got some entries? Have you got full entries so far or how's yeah, we've it got it's pretty low key with these things and it's funny, you know, and I guess folks would know when they plan their own rides as well like you put an event page up on Facebook and you might say you get like 30 people who say yes that probably means maybe 10 will show up if you're lucky so um, an internet yes is probably worth about yeah 20 to 30 percent of a real world yes yeah um, but we've got I've got a, a list of you know 30 to 40 people who said they're, they're wow. coming along yeah um, what that turns into who knows there's a fella from from Belgium who's done some pretty big bikepacking events around around the world, and he's booked his ticket and he's on his way. Um, so I was stoked about that. That was that's, that's great. That's commitment. That's yeah, great. Yeah. So, um, but who knows? If I have a, a couple of guys from overseas uh, coming along, and you know, ten or fifteen guys from Australia, um, that'd be amazing. I'd be so happy with that because I just really wanted um, to create an excuse for people to go out and have a similar sort of adventure. Yeah. Um, because I, I've uh, I really got a gotten a kick out of these big races in the States. So, but why should I have to go to the States um, to do it? Why can't we just do something it's, here It's too? surprising that we don't have something here already. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but anyway, we'll see how it goes this year. I haven't, I've been, uh, I've got a little Facebook page that, that's kind of um, promoting it a bit. Um, but yeah, it's pretty low key. Um, look, if, if, if we get um, 50 people showing up, that'd be amazing if we, to be honest though, if it was just myself, it's a ride I want to do. Yeah. Um, and I feel that way about about rides that that you know will plan as well. If you if you're putting putting on a ride, um, you know you should be able to you should want to do it yourself. That's so, right. Yeah. If, so you will be doing it. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. definitely be doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. yeah, unless unless my body falls apart or something terrible yeah. happens, I'll be I'll be there. So yeah, yeah really looking forward to it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, Jesse Carlson, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. It's been so interesting. And uh, we'll chat soon. Yeah, we'll do. Thanks, mate. Um, drop bar, drop bar mountain bike, or is it a cross bike with mountain bike tires is this what um, this is, is this what adam wrote the other day yeah yeah at, at the yank so this is our prototype we're calling it the gmx yeah so forget about bmx it's yeah. all about the gmx the gmx <laughs> gmx bandits nice so it's just uh yeah cyclocross geometry yeah um but built around a mountain bike fork so we can get yeah we've got 2.4 inch tires of adam wrote on the weekend um he was it, flying too yeah yeah he was flying he does that he was absolutely flying, mate. Yeah. So this one's a prototype. We've still got to change a few things, so we'll have the next prototype in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, but we're pretty happy with the handling. Yeah. Um, it's just great fun. You know, you look down and you see this big fat tire, but you're on the drops. Um, and you think, okay, I'm on drops, so I shouldn't have any traction. Because, But then you just rail it around corners. It's just, yeah, it's so much fun. Um, yeah, so it's... Um, yeah, this could be this could be the perfect race to the rock bike. Um, you reckon this will be a race to the rock bike? Yeah, I think so. Could be. Yeah. So no, it's, um, it's good fun. We've had fun belting around the trails on this one over the last couple of couple of weeks. So yeah, looking forward to the next prototype. Awesome, man. Yeah.